Hello and welcome to the Divorce to Bliss podcast. Here you will learn all things related to healing from divorce, mind, body, and spirit, so you can create a beautiful new life filled with happiness. I'm Rachel Ruby, author of Divorce to Bliss, divorce coach, speaker, and attorney, and I'm so glad you found me here. Hello and welcome to the Divorce to Bliss podcast. I'm Rachel S. Ruby, and I'm so happy to have you here. Today, we are going to be talking about pet custody mediation. And because dogs and other pets are so important and such a big part of many of our lives, including my own, they become a part of our healing journey. But oftentimes, we don't think about what happens to those pets prior to the healing journey when we're going through the divorce and even pre-divorce. So today, my guest is Karis Nafti. And Karis is the founder of Who Keeps the Dog? She is a pet custody mediator, a, an accredited family mediator. She has 25 years of professional experience as a dog behavior expert, and she brings that to the world of dogs and divorce. Karis also has, she's the author of a book, Who Keeps the Dog? And she teaches divorce professionals how to, what are the best practices for dogs during a divorce and through her or through her pet guardian education course. So welcome to the podcast, Karis. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So one other caveat, um, as we go through this podcast, we will be saying dogs a lot, but we obviously we are referring to your pets. I uh, just wanted to bring that out in case anyone has a cat or a pig or some other pet, <laughs> but we will be saying dogs because um, that is the easier term. So why don't we start, Karis, with you explaining exactly what you do and how you got into it and why it is important for people with pets who are about to go through divorce or facing divorce to talk to someone like you. So I got into this work after, as you said in my intro, many, many years as a dog behavior expert and as a dog trainer. So I've spent a long time working with families and their dogs and in that time, sort of over the last, I would say, 10 years of my career, I've noticed many, many clients of mine, many dogs who were stressed about their life or having anxiety problems or different sort of behavior issues. And the reason why they were behaving the way they were was because of the custody decision. So when I say the custody decision, I don't necessarily mean... Um, Maybe the divorce had already happened. Maybe it happened a year ago. Maybe it happened six months ago. But the dogs were not coping with the decision that had been made because it wasn't right for the dogs. So, for example, um, some of the people I was seeing, there were dogs who were in a shared custody situation and the dogs were pretty stressed by that and they and they were acting out because of it. I worked with other people where, um, you know, one spouse had a better lawyer, let's just put it that way and put it simply, and that person ended up with the dog, but as soon as they got the dog, they didn't actually want it. They weren't walking the dog, they weren't giving the attention that they needed, they just were kind of using the dog. They were using the dog to get back at their ex, you know, people do that kind of stuff, which is really sad. And yeah. as I was exploring with these clients what was going on and what had happened in their divorce and how would they come to this decision, I decided to focus myself in this world as someone who could help with a background in dog behavior and a background in dog psychology to help educate the world and, and my own clients individually. How do you make a decision about divorce that's good for your dog? Because often as soon as the divorce is happening, it's so emotional. It is so can be so traumatic and so difficult for people that they focus more on keeping what they want rather than thinking about what's best for the dog. And that's not like a conscious thing necessarily, um, but it happens. And I know this, I've been divorced twice myself. So I have walked down that road. I know what it feels like. I know, I know that very, very dark tunnel that can feel like it's going to go on forever. <laughs> and so it's sort of that experience that led me to do this work. And what I do now is I work as a pet custody mediator. So I work with people directly who are going through a breakup or a divorce to help them make the right decision about their animal themselves so that they don't have to go to court over it. 
Um, and I also educate divorced people, um, divorce professionals. So other mediators and lawyers, collaborative divorce experts, divorce coaches, um, what best practice means for dogs um, in custody situations. Yeah, I, that's so wonderful. And I, I, I have to believe that you're one of or the only person maybe in this realm because I've never heard of that before. So I love that you're taking all of your experience and, and focusing it on this because I, I feel like, like you said, when we're going through that time and it feels so difficult and challenging, we often don't think about what's right for the dog. We just think about like, I want to take the dog with me. So, yeah. yeah. yeah and they exactly. can't tell us, unlike children, they can't tell us how they're feeling, but we'll get to, we'll get to that. But um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they, the, I help people, work through their emotional their emotional challenges i mean not that emotions are bad emotions are mm-hmm. intrinsically intrinsically part of us but we have to know are we making a decision based on our own emotions are we making a decision based on history and based on our fears or are we making a decision based on love for the animal and their well-being going forward yeah, that's it's so wonderful that there's someone like you who does this. And I know, let's talk a little bit about dogs' ability to pick up on human emotions, because I know um, my dog definitely does that. And what can happen to a dog when there's fighting going on in the home during a relationship split? This really depends on dogs who react to stress very differently, depending on the breed of the dog and their mm-hmm. own personal history. So if, for example, you let's say you have a rescue dog that has come from an abusive background, okay, even if you're the most wonderful owner in the world, if they came from a place of neglect or abuse in some form, dogs like that especially will be very, very aware and tuned in to people who are emotional or upset or maybe just behaving in a way that doesn't feel predictable to the dog. And mm-hmm. some, this can also be the same for certain breed types. So um, certain breeds are bred to be more sensitive to body language than others. Um, so dogs like, um, like for example, border collies, they, in order to herd sheep the way they do, they have to see the littlest movement from the sheep in the field to sort of judge what they're doing. And so they are incredibly sensitive to body language. Um, and we could go through... In many different breeds. I mean, and you know, there's lots of them. But but to go back to your question, I find especially dogs who are had any sort of instability previously in their own in their own personal history are likely to react to stress either by running away from it or possibly feeling like they have to defend themselves. So mm-hmm. it's possible that when you're like if you if you're having a loud fight with your spouse or your soon to be ex. If your dog is scared, I see. I work with clients who will nip at people sometimes, or they'll start standing by one person and growling at the other one um, because the dog is scared. The dog is suddenly in a situation where they don't feel safe, and they will rely on sort of strategy that helped them previously. So, if a dog had to defend itself or or had to, then it will it will click back into that strategy of what worked for them. Other dogs, when there's a stressful something happening, and this is always a bit poignant and and kind of sweet and sad, um, they will try to make it better. So those will be the dogs who will come up and try to lick your face. They will they will go in between people who are having a fight. They might distract you with a toy. They might try to act really silly. And it's not really because they're playful, genuinely, but that is a social strategy that some dogs use to deal with conflict to sort of distract the other one from it. So um, it really, you you will see lots of different responses from dogs. And it's usually, if you have a very sensitive dog, you'll get a very extreme response, which is either the dog is somehow trying to help, (laughs) whatever that looks like for the dog. My one dog, if I'm upset, likes to bring me a sock. Like that's his vibe. I don't know. That's what he does. Um, (laughs) um, Or or you'll get a dog who, who will go into sort of a defensive mode. And then you'll also get dogs who, are not as affected by stress and like they don't really seem to notice and and lucky for them though they're those you get those dogs also it's so fascinating this whole dog psychology 
I, I, I just find it very interesting. And I tried to analyze my own dog for many years and she was, she was, um, a rescue. And we, I believe that there was, um, some kind of an abuse incident when she was a puppy by a man. She's very scared of men, especially if they have on hoodies and dark hoodies and they're tall and, um, but yeah, she is very protective of me and anyone who comes into my house, even if it's a friend, she's very protective. So, um, yeah, it really helps to work with someone like you to understand the dog and the behavior because a lot of us don't may not see it. Or like you said, if the dog comes up between two people who are fighting with a toy, they might think, oh, look, the dog's being cute and not really not realize what the dog is actually trying to do, which is stop the stressful event and or protect and or protect one or both of the people. So um, very, very interesting. How do we look for signs that our dogs are stressed? If obviously we we're, we're not sure you kind of mentioned some of those. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And, and it's a, it's a subtle thing because dogs are so different individually and depending on their age and their breed. But the best advice I have for looking to see if your dog is stressed is to watch for a, like kind of a distinct change in their behavior. So on the most, in the most simple form, um, look at the sort of energy level of the dog. If you had a dog that was pretty playful and pretty bouncy and lots and lots of energy, if a dog like that is suddenly sleeping a lot, maybe mm -hmm. just kind of resting more than normal, it could be because they're stressed by what's going on at home and that's how they're, that's what their body's doing with the stress. Other dogs will do the opposite. They'll get a lot more hype. They'll, they'll start barking at everything, like seem like they're becoming annoying. Like that's, there's no other good way to say it. Like really, really demanding, yeah. really. Um, and, and on the extreme side, which happens for a lot of dogs is one of the ways they'll deal with that, the stress and the excitement is they'll start chewing on stuff. So you mm -hmm. might see an like dog destroying shoes or the dogs chewed up your remote or, you know, something, something that you found valuable, the dog suddenly chewed apart. And this is where it's really important for people to understand the difference between human psychology and dog psychology. So if, for example, you have your very, very favorite pair of expensive running shoes, let's say, for example, um, you value those shoes because they're useful to you. You might have spent a lot of money on them. If your dog were to chew up your running shoes, it's easy to assume that your dog is angry at you and is destroyed something. A lot of it's like they get upset and they, they, they feel like, well, the dog's upset, um, you know, because I left him home alone or because I went on a date with someone new. You know, these are some of the things that go through people's heads sometimes. But from a dog's perspective, chewing is something that dogs will do. Like I said, if they're bored, if they're frustrated, chewing is a real natural entertainment and stress reliever for dogs but it's not something that's used out of revenge it's just a fun yeah. thing for them but what they will like to do the most is chew on something if there's nothing food-ish available to chew on they will chew on something that smells like the person that they love the most so oh. they will chew on your running shoes because they smell the most like your feet where like a lot of your scent is so it's almost in a weird way, an expression of love or affection mm -hmm. because the dog is choosing the thing that's smell. And that's why eyeglasses get chewed on so much remote controls, um, you know, all the things you time is, which is so frustrating. But, um, but, but that, for example, is really helpful for people to get context. It's like, I know it's horrible when dogs chew on things, but dogs are not complicated enough to chew out of spite or to like send you a message about something because they have no concept of value. They just know stuff's fun to do on and they go with what tastes good and smells good. So, sorry, that was a sidebar, but hopefully that's helpful to some of your listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that is, that's so interesting because, you know, uh, you'll see someone, you know, yelling at a dog, like, you know, bad dog, you know, and I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that dogs understand that message. Like, maybe they do like, ah, uh, hey, if you catch them in the act and, oh, you're not, I'm not supposed to do that, but I don't, like you said, it could be a, a love thing. It could be just, I don't know, or a frustration. My dog, when my dog gets really stressed out, she chews on herself. Yeah. That's a common one yeah. too. It's like chewing nails. Yeah. Yep. They, they'll they yeah. also do yeah. that. And, and yeah. you're right. Shouting at dogs as a very quick answer to that. 
first of all, dogs don't speak English. Okay, so you cannot shout right. and explain to your dog why you're upset. Dogs also don't understand like things that happened before, but they do understand body language. So mm -hmm. if you are upset and you are shouting for whatever reason, whether the dog has chewed on something or whether the dog sat like an angel, you know, and, and the neighbor came over and destroyed the shoe, it doesn't matter. Right. Your dog, they respond to your body language. And if you are angry, if you are aggressive, dogs have one of two options. They can, um, you know, they could potentially fight back and defend themselves. Or what most commonly happens with domestic dogs is they become very, very submissive, which we misinterpret as guilt. Dogs are not complicated enough to feel guilt, but they will certainly roll on their back or they'll go run and hide or they'll turn their head away if you're shouting at them because what else can they do? <laughs> they're trying, they're yeah. trying to calm you down. Yeah. Wow. That's so, this is so fascinating. I love, I love this. Um, so many people going through divorce rely on their dogs as an emotional support crutch. Um, my dog was a huge emotional support. I wouldn't say crutch, but she, she definitely contributed to my healing so much. Um, and she, and she loved that. She, we, we really bonded in that period. Um, but some dogs aren't cut out for this. And you've kind of alluded to that already by, some of this beha behavior and things like that. So how does one know whether their dog, maybe when they're first starting this process, fits into one category or the other, whether their dog is going to be a dog that is going to welcome that, I guess, reliance and that placing of the dog in the position of helping to heal or whether this might not be good for the dog? So I think all dogs can help us heal. It's about understanding what that looks like for any given dog. So you might have, if you have, let's say, a dog that is a, a super active dog and it has a lot of energy and, and um, you know, his idea of fun is not sitting on the couch and, and watching Netflix. It might be that if your, dog is, if your dog is the sort that wants to be very active and engage with other dogs, what I encourage people to do is is get the joy from watching your dog being happy. Not yeah. all dogs want to, are not physically cuddly dogs. Um, some just simply are not. It's not something they enjoy. They might want to sit in the room with you, but they don't want to be physical, physically cuddled. And you can't demand that of them if they don't want it. I mean, I have two dogs now, and my one dog, if I let him, will sit with me constantly. And my other one loves to follow me, the one who's in this picture, Sam. Um, but he's not very, he's not very tech. He doesn't really love too many cuddles. That's just his vibe. Mm -hmm. So, so we can all rely on our dogs, but what you have to, I suppose, be cognizant of is simple things like, does your dog be in, enjoy being um, pet and cuddled a lot? And if they don't, you need to respect that. Um, yeah. What people should make sure of is that they're not, um, that, that in the sort of challenging time of going through the divorce or the breakup, that they're not suddenly asking their dog to be with them 24 hours a day. That can become really tiring for any dog. So if you do work from home and your dog's with you, you know, you should kind of allow, you know, you got to let your dog rest and just, and, and be a dog and don't be so, don't assume that your dog has the energy physically or emotionally to sort of sit with you all the time and, and, and be too close unless they choose to, in which case, go for it. So you kind of have to take your own dog's lead with how um, involved they are and in what way and, and try to be happy yeah. when they're happy, which is, which is a real good healing thing also. Yeah. Such great advice. I wish, uh, yeah, I wish I had known this before. And, and like you said, so many dogs are so different and it's interesting. Like my dog isn't real cuddly, but when I sit on the couch at night, she loves that. She'll come and almost sit on me. Like she has to be so close to me that she's almost pushing me over. But it's not the cuddling. It's just the feeling my presence. And so I've learned that that's what she likes. She doesn't want to be, you know, hugged and all that. But she loves that feeling of being next to me when she wants to be. So it's really about understanding your dog. And I love that. What about um, when someone goes into a shared custody of the dog? And I know, again, you've kind of brought this up, but what are some problems that one might encounter? And I don't know if you have any uh, further examples of that 
when you do agree to a shared custody? Well, if people want to do shared custody, if they if they wanted if that's what they would like to do with their ex, mm. I would advise that they go in with a mindset that, that they have to try it to see if it's going to work. We don't know with any dog. There's no way to know if it's something that will work for them in the long run. So it's I like to bring that up with people so that they they can accept that and if yeah. they really and and kind of have the conversation like if your dog is becoming very stressed by this you know what, someone is going to have to take primary ownership or guardianship of that dog and if you love the dog enough are we willing to have that conversation and most people are it's a hard one of course um yeah. so so with shared custody if you have a dog that is a very sort of naturally nervous and more anxious kind of dog um, again, whether from abusive background or just genetics breed type, um, shared custody can be very challenging for them. Um, you know, just moving between two homes often doesn't work yeah. for them in the long. Um, so, so that's the one thing to think about. I think in the media now, because pet custody is something people are talking about, because we love our dogs as much as we do, there's a tendency to speak about them like we speak about our children. And, mm -hmm. and it's cute. And I know we all call ourselves dog moms and dog dads and all of that, which is very sweet. But dogs are not children. And there needs yeah. to be, be a, a kind, ruthless separation in terms of how we view dogs. It's like dogs don't need to stay in touch. They don't need to stay in constant contact with the two people who've raised them in order to be happy. That's, they simply don't. To imagine that they have to is, is completely humanizing an animal. So... Mm -hmm. So, with, so there's two parts to the shared custody thing that can be a challenge. The one is that the dog might not cope with it. The other thing is that the people might not cope with it. Because what you have to realize is if you decide to do shared custody with your dog, you are also signing up to stay in contact with your ex for many, many years yeah. going forward. At the time, if you have a fairly, if you're having a, kind of a, you know, an amicable separation and a peaceful breakup, it probably seems very reasonable to say, oh, no, no, we're fine. We're, we're going to continue to be friends. We're going to share the dog. But yeah. you don't know how that will feel in six months. You don't know how that will feel when one of you gets into a serious relationship. And mm. you just don't know how that will shift. And many people who contact me for mediation have already been sharing their dog for many months or a few years. And they can't handle it anymore because of the people factor. That is such a valid point. And I know in my own divorce that because I was more bonded with my dog uh, and because I do have an anxious dog, I knew instinctively that she would not do well going back and forth. And that because she because she is a rescue that she might feel when she went to his home that I had left her. And so I didn't want that. And so I drafted up a stipulation. And one of those points was that she got to live with me and that if he wanted to, he could see her. But that never really came to fruition and he ended up getting a new dog. So, you know, I think I just knew that she wouldn't do well with the going back and forth because of who she is and her personality. But um, I love that. So you can actually talk to people and evaluate the dog and the behavior and help make suggestions as to what might be best for the dog. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's why my clients want to work with me because I am a yeah. mediator, but, but it's like, I also am something, I'm something else also. I don't quite know what category to put myself into because I'm on the dog, dog side. whisperer, dog <laughs> whisperer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, I'm, I'm on I'm on the side of the dog in the situation. So if people yeah. are suggesting things that will simply cause stress to the dog in the long run, then I bring we have that conversation. I say, listen, from yeah. the perspective of the dog, given the given your particular dog in the history, um, I will offer ideas that then um, for them to think about to try to just to try to make the best decision for the dog, definitely or the cat. Yeah. And it, it, this is a wonderful resource. And I feel like so many more people need to know that you are out there and available. So if unless there's anything else you care to share that we haven't covered, 
I would love to ask you to share um, where the listeners and viewers can find you, can find your book and get more information because I think this is such a great um, service that you provide. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I, I'm, I really appreciate being able to share it because it's so... The, the last piece of advice that I will share to anyone listening, whether they're going through a divorce or they're a divorce professional, is if you do have a dog, try to talk about it as soon as possible. Don't leave mm -hmm. it till the end. Don't leave it as an unspoken. Address it because the sooner it's dealt with, the less likely um, the emotions can get so big around the dog. So that that's my my closing piece of advice. Deal with it. Try to do it in some kind of sense of it with a mediator um, and, and deal with it as soon as possible. People can find my book. Look, this is my book. I'm so excited. It's Yay! just out. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. I know. It's so exciting. Um, it's like a new baby. It's like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you birthed, so you birthed it a new baby. <laughs> baby, yay. Um, people can visit me on my website, which is whokeepsthedog.com. And I offer a free consultation to any new clients. So if anybody listening is curious, wants to see if it's, if it's a good fit, they can, they can book a free consultation with me before we do the actual mediation process. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Everybody can find me there. And, and, and also for someone, if you just want some advice about if you think you can do the custody thing by yourself, um, I highly recommend taking my book. Um, because that's what it's for. It's a guide. It's a very concise book. It's it's written in easy language. Um, you can read it in an hour or two, um, mm -hmm. and it should help give you some of the answers you might be looking for. Wonderful. And we have all of your contact information up on the screen. And for those who are listening, we will have the information in the show notes. So if you didn't catch that, don't worry. And um, thank you so much for being here. I think you provide such a valuable service. Oh, I did have one last question. If somebody, if people are already going through a divorce and let's say they're working with a mediator or an attorney, I'm assuming that they can contact you and bring you into that um, negotiation as far as the dog is concerned, correct? Oh, yes, definitely. I love, that's okay. my favorite is to work in, in collaboration. Absolutely. I, I don't do the whole yeah. divorce. I just dog. Right. Um, and right. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So please reach out to Karis if you have any other questions, check out what she does. She is really an amazing woman and I love, I just love that there is a voice for the dogs um, or the pets, so to speak. And thank you so much for being with me today. It was really fascinating and informative. And I hope that everybody listening and watching was able to pick up some new information and know that there's someone out there who can help you with pet custody issues. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.